So as um, it was stated, I am a pharmacist. I've been a pharmacist for roughly 40 years, uh, 13 of which has been with the uh, Cancer Center, Palmetto Cancer Center here in New York City. Uh, so I have seen many changes in medicine and the world of pharmacy. And today I'm hoping to give you just a little perspective on your prescription medication and maybe address some um, uh, questions or concerns about uh, generic versus brand name medications. So first a little bit about the FDA approval process and I'll take you through this pathway. So it pretty much starts with the uh, discovery of the medication, a new agent that may have a promise for a, uh, a beneficial uh, clinical need. It will lead to a company developing that particular drug to a useful product, uh, which then will lead to some testing, again, to, to try to vouch for its validity, which will hopefully will lead to clinical trials, and then eventually approval of the drug for marketing. Uh, then the marketing component is where the drug company needs to be able to fit this into the area where it's going to be needed, communication to the uh, clinicians, uh, developing ways of how the drug is going to be distributed, which uh, is addressed on the supply uh, chain distribution, um, is it going to be available over the counter, uh, prescription. Uh, some of you may experience that now there's a regular retail pharmacy and there's a specialty pharmacy. Is it going to be one of those two? Uh, the prescribing and dispensing regulations, is a, uh, as I said, is it going to be a controlled substance or a prescription item and so forth. This whole process is a, takes a pretty long timeline. Um, anywhere from 12 to 20 years before a product uh, goes from its inception when it was discovered to potentially have usefulness until it's finally uh, used in, uh, in our market. So this is all governed by the FDA, the United States Food and Drug Administration. Uh, it begins with the discovery of the agent in some chemical labs. Sometimes what they have done over the years, some of the discoveries were through serendipity, somebody just came across something that worked. Uh, later on, they, they started to take a molecule and be able to modify that and make it uh, better, make it stronger, make it have less side effects, uh, make it so that you only have to take it once a day as opposed to four times a day. So that leads to the discovery of these new agents. Uh, then it leads to the second phase, which is the preclinical research and development. Again, more testing of the product, more uh, manufacturing of that particular agent are we able to make this in a suitable, suitable quantity to be able to provide it to all the patients that need it? Um, it goes on to additional laboratory testing, which sometimes it involves some animal testing, again, just to see how, um, you know, try to simulate conditions within a human body, uh, how an animal would be able to tolerate this particular medication. <coughs> the end goal is to getting an approval from something we call an institutional review board. So this is a board usually made of clinicians, uh, sometimes business people, administrators, ethicists, uh, sometimes clergy, just to understand and make sure that clinical trials are done appropriately and protecting all the rights of, uh, of uh, human beings. Um, if this is all successful, then the drug company will file what's called an IND, or Investigational New Drug with the FDA. Once approved, they can begin their clinical trials. The uh, research and development uh, is all, all trials are approved by the IRB. So at different stages, they have to again, go to a uh, institutional review board. At NYU Langone Health, we have an IRB and they review all uh, uh, great varied types of uh, clinical trials in all different uh, fields. The, uh, the clinical trial testing, usually it's broken up into three phases. Phase one, where we're gonna test the product on uh, healthy human subjects. A lot of the efforts here are to determine how that drug is going to be handled by our body. Is it going to be absorbed, something you take orally? How is it going to be metabolized? How is it going to be eliminated? Um, and of course, we start to determine if it has negative effects, uh, side effects, adverse events, things that we don't expect. If those all go satisfactory, we'll go on to uh, phase two studies, which now we're going to test this product on individuals with the disease. So at this point, they also develop what they call cohorts or groups of, uh, of, of testing uh, subjects where they're going to test a different dose. The intent here is to find the dose that's going to be, the, the highest dose that's going to be tolerated 
and still remain efficacious. This way you know that you have a good product, if it's tolerable and if it does what uh, in intended activity is. If that goes successful, then it'll go on to phase three studies, which now we're going to uh, take this drug at that dose that we think is going to be the proper dose and test it against a larger scale of individuals with the disease. Through this whole process, there's a, besides the, one of the things the IRB review, review board establishes is the consent. So we need to give the investigators consent to participate in the trial. And as some of you uh, have experienced this, and you'll see there's a lot of information about the, um, the product that's being tested, your rights, what to do with, uh, as far as reporting adverse events, uh, your right to stop uh, the uh, trial at any point. Uh, sometimes they may have what they call a crossover uh, option. So they may study a drug against the placebo, and at some point you may have the option of crossing over, and they'll determine what side of the trial you were on, and then if you were taking a placebo or a, a fake drug, you'll go on to an active drug just to get additional information and maybe provide some additional benefit. If all of this is successful, then the drug company will file a NDA or new drug application. Uh, this is the uh, beginning stages of the FDA review. They'll, they'll uh, use FDA experts to review the data. I know the slide says expects, but experts is the, the word here that we're looking for in this uh, slide. Um, the company will address the FDA concerns. So the FDA obviously has experts. They're going to have some questions about the trial question about the drug, question about reported adverse events, and they want those to be uh, answered to their satisfaction. A lot of times they'll use advisory committees. These are clinicians that are experts in this field, and they'll be able to give the FDA advice uh, whether to approve this particular drug or, or not. If all of that is successful, uh, then the FDA will grant approval for that particular drug. Uh, by this time, the company will start to finalize its marketing strategy, also its uh, supply chain distribution. They also will know the type of controls that the drug will have, the type of restrictions. Uh, is it going to be something available over the counter? Is it going to be through a prescription? And it's uh, for one of these uh, special indications, is it going to have to be distributed through specialty pharmacies? Most of these are uh, usually handled through mail order service. So there are uh, drugs in oncology. You see a lot of them with uh, specialty pharmacy distribution. Also other uh, uh, rheumatology and other infectious disease will go through the special distribution process. Some uh, special growth hormones are also through that process. So it's, they are licensed pharmacies, but they specialize in these, uh, these uh, medications. And there's, uh, there's a lot of interaction between them and the, uh, the uh, patient. Is, uh, they will communicate with the patient to, understand, to make sure that you understand how to take the medication, make sure you know where and how to report any problems with the medication, and try to more or less keep you uh, on schedule. So the drug will appear on the market. Um, testing is not complete. There is a requirement for post-marketing surveillance. So the drug companies are required to continue to test the product, especially to follow up on any reported adverse events. So there are systems where if a, 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 a um, adverse reaction or a um, allergy to a drug or any type of uh, um, um, activity or event that wasn't intended is reported, we will actually file that with the FDA. There's a uh, process called MedWatch. Uh, so we do that at institutions like NYU. As we have a report, the pharmacist will uh, you know, investigate the report and then complete this. So the FDA gathers this information. If it's a new agent, then they're going to feed that back to the manufacturer to have them uh, answer their concerns. Sometimes it may require a change in dosing, for example, uh, um, or maybe additional education to the, uh, to the clinicians and the patients. In addition, there's also follow-up. In addition to follow-up studies, there's also inspections by the FDA to make sure that the manufacturers are following uh, establish good manufacturing practices. So they need to maintain uh, uh, complete records. Their uh, manufacturing processes need to be the same as what they filed with the FDA when they got approval for the particular drug. So the drug has been on the market and 
then we come across a point where now there may be a possibility for a generic product or, or a competitor to this uh, product. So the uh, drug patent protection for a drug can last anywhere from a five to seven years. In some cases, additional time is granted if it's, uh, it's a drastic change in therapy, uh, we'll give them a, a increased exclusivity. So if it's a, um, a breakthrough type medication, the FDA will grant them additional uh, time on their particular patent. There's always a lot of activity that goes on between the generic company filing and the, uh, the innovator um, sometimes challenging a, uh, a generic company from uh, uh, being able to market their product. Uh, there's a lot of patent protection, so there's a lot of legal activity that goes on behind the scenes before a generic drug is, is started on its path. The generic uh, companies, or the, for the generic drug, they need an abbreviated new drug application. So it's abbreviated because now they're not required to repeat a lot of the costly, costly animal and clinical research on the ingredients or dosage forms already approved for safety and effectiveness by the FDA. So that, all that has already been done. The generic companies are basically concentrating on being able to prove that their product is going to be equal to the innovator. The FDA approved generics must meet the same rigid standards as the innovator drug to gain FDA approval. These generic drugs must contain the same active ingredient as the innovator. Um, the inactive ingredients, however, can vary. And sometimes these are things that, for example, may be used to hold the tablet together, to allow a tablet to disperse, uh, tablet coating, and so forth. Uh, those are allowed to be different, but the active ingredient needs to be the same. They need to be identical in strength, dosage form, meaning tablet, capsule, liquid, and router administration. You take it by mouth, you take it as an injection. Is it something you apply to the skin? Um, they also need to have the same indications. That means, what is that product going to be used for? Um, so that's what we call the indications. It's, it's what, what the FDA approved the use for that particular drug, what diseases, what conditions it's going to be used for. Also, they need to be bioequivalent. That means that this drug, when taken, if it's an oral agent, needs to be absorbed in a similar manner as the innovator, needs to be distributed in our body in a similar manner, metabolized, and eliminated in the same way. They also need the same, to meet the same batch testing requirements for identity, strength, and purity, and quality as the innovator. Um, be manufactured under the same strict standards, um, and these are very much regulated as the original product. So very often the FDA will, will make uh, inspections at manufacturing facilities, and if there are issues, they will, uh, they will uh, recall their product until they've satisfied conditions uh, or improved them. And that type of action doesn't only happen to generic companies, but sometimes also may happen to an innovator drug, brand name drugs. Uh, lately, that has been some of the causes for drug shortages, where all of a sudden we can't get a particular agent. And sometimes it may be due because of a FDA activity on the product, either from an innovator or from a generic. The generic substitution in New York State is mandated, which means that unless your doctor indicates on the prescription, do not substitute, the pharmacist has to uh, dispense the uh, generic substitution. In some states like New Jersey, the consumer or the patient can also make that decision. However, in a lot of cases, the insurance company will have a little a difference in both coverage and co-pays. So in some cases, they may not cover the brand name, but will cover the generic. In other cases, the co-pay for the brand name drug might be a lot higher than the uh, generic equivalent. So again, these are drugs that have met the same conditions for manufacture. They essentially have to be the same, and they do have to appear on the state's approved list of uh, generic manufacturers. So some states use a uh, uh, compendia called the Orange Book. Other states create their own list of uh, drugs and manufacturers. So um, you know, a, uh, a generic product and all the manufacturers will be listed. So this way the pharmacies know uh, what, uh, what manufacturers they're allowed to dispense. Most pharmacies are computerized now, and all that information is fed into the database, so the pharmacist already knows the products on the shelf are already um, approved uh, substitutable products. A little bit about your prescription. So your prescription, first of all, 
Medication dispensing is regulated by the uh, State Board of Pharmacy. So in New York, it's a New York State Board of Pharmacy. Uh, these um, prescription medications are um, obtained from registered pharmacy that meet the requirements and regulations of the state board. So they have to have uh, certain conditions uh, for security, for safety, proper storage, um, and these have to be dispensed by registered pharmacists that are also licensed by the individual state uh, boards of pharmacy. Your prescription label has a lot of information. There's a lot of information that's actually required. The patient pharmacy and prescriber identification is one of the uh, pro the elements that have to appear on every prescription. There's also a unique prescription identifier or prescription number and the pharmacist's initials. Most of these are pre-printed by a computer system, but they do appear on, the, uh, on your prescription label. Drug identification, which has to include the name and manufacturer of the product and the brand reference if it's a substituted product. So it's substituted for, so at least you know that it's the same as your particular uh, um, brand name product. The drug strength, quantity dispense, directions for use, dispensing date, drug expiration date or use by date, storage instructions, usually storage instructions if they're other than ambient room temperature. Uh, most of those won't say it, but it's, it's assumed ambient room temperature. But if, we, if it requires refrigeration, it will be stated on your label. It may be with a, what we call an auxiliary label, a little sticker that reminds you keep it in the refrigerator or keep it in the freezer, uh, protect from light. Um, other information there, uh, such as may cause drowsiness, take with food, take on an empty stomach, uh, are also uh, included in your pharmacy labeling. Um, refill information, it tells you how many refills uh, are already authorized by your prescriber. Um, most pharmacies now, once you've exceeded the, the refill amount, if it's a refillable drug, sometimes they will contact your prescriber for you, either electronically or by phone, the old-fashioned way, to obtain authorization for additional refills. In some cases, a new prescription has to be issued, and that sometimes can also be worked out between your pharmacist and your, uh, your physician. There's also a drug information and medication pamphlet, which is, many of us actually won't, don't read it. It's, it's, uh, expressed in easy to read language. So it is important to at least the first time glance at it, look for the Im important information on that. With uh, some drugs, there are some cautionary statements. There's a lot of drugs that the FDA has deemed to have what's called a black box. In other words, they have certain warnings. Uh, so in that case, there's a, that particular additional information in these, um, in these pamphlets. All right, just a little participatory question here. Where do you store medications? And your choices are there. The uh, medicine cabinet in the bathroom, kitchen cabinet, or designated drawer or closet in the bedroom? So none you, of the above. None of the above, okay. <laughs> I should have added none of the above. <laughs> so we'll give that a little time to uh, wind down. All right, so most of us are using the uh, designated drawer in the closet in the bedroom. Um, the next question, do you keep your medications in the original containers? And again, the usual uh, response, and you keep that. Okay, very good. So for the first question, there really is no right answer provided we're meeting the uh, storage conditions. And the storage conditions for most medications, it's a cool, dry environment. You may have a special container in your medicine cabinet in the bathroom that can provide that level of, of control, humidity and uh, uh, fluctuations in temperature, the things that we want to be concerned about. High temperature is, is, is more critical than lower temperature. I know my slide says 68 to 77, but the actual tolerance is, uh, is a little bit uh, much lower on the cool side, a little bit higher on, uh, on, the, on the high temperature, but I just went by the, uh, the most drastic. Um, so again, a cool, dry environment. Um, a lot of people use uh, uh, 
a, a special section in the kitchen. Again, as long as it provides that type of environment, it's still good. And the uh, special drawer in the bedroom is, uh, is uh, to me, that's the, the ideal place. Also provides another level of security. And unfortunately, we do have to concern about uh, security of our medications from our uh, you know, uh, family and friends. Um, so for those reasons, I mean, it's, uh, uh, the bedroom might be the best place. But as long as where you're storing it provides a cool, dry environment, uh, then that's the ideal place. Also, it's the place where you're going to be more likely to take your medication, and it's going to have a, a good amount of light, so you can read the labels, make sure that the, uh, the, the tablet inside is what you are accustomed to, uh, you're familiar with. Some of the pharmacies also include a description of the tablet uh, as part of the label, so it just reminds you that this is supposed to be maybe an orange uh, tablet that's round-shaped. Uh, so those things help you, and a lot of times, you know, as far as um, safety, we depend on you to uh, give us that kind of feedback. If something is, it doesn't appear right, you, sh you should question it. Uh, refrigerator temperature is 36 to 46. So as I mentioned before, your uh, prescription label will have those instructions to store them in the refrigerator. So again, a special bin or drawer in the home refrigerator is ideal. If not, then this is, uh, a lot of people use those uh, Tupperwares or, or those other plastic containers. The only reason to put them in there is just to keep them separate from your food. If something spills on it, you're not going to contaminate uh, your medications. There's uh, different types of dispensing containers. Uh, there are uh, rigid uh, plastic vials and bottles with uh, child safety caps is what usually comes from the pharmacy for both your tablets, capsules, and uh, liquids. There's also what we call a unit of use package, which could be a topical or external drug a cream, ointment, lotion, and sometimes even patches, those won't have a child safety uh, uh, container. But again, there's a, there's a minimized risk of, uh, of uh, uh, poison with those. Um, some oral solids also come in what's called a blister pack. And uh, some of you may travel to other uh, countries. And in a lot of countries, when you get a prescription from the pharmacy, you get in these little boxes. So these are these blister packs or unit of use. The intention is for that whole supply to last you for that whole treatment. Um, in America, most, most, most of the times you get your prescription in a prescription uh, bottle. So I also talked about keeping your medication in the original container. So the original container, number one, it has all the information about your medication. Number two, it's, it's in the best place designed to uh, store that medication. However, many of you have complicated multi-drug uh, treatments and you do use your, uh, your pill boxes. The, uh, so again, as long as you keep those in a secure place, still in that uh, uh, cool and dry environment, and don't fill them up too much ahead of time. So one week ahead of time should be sufficient. Uh, so these are uh, tools that people use to remind them uh, when to take their medicine, uh, you know how to organize that. Especially if, you have, uh, if, you're, if you're helping somebody else as a caretaker or somebody's helping you, uh, so it's best that they understand when to give you the, those medicines. So uh, the pill boxes are also acceptable uh, as long as they are uh, controlled and in a um, uh, proper environment. Um, the expiration dates, they either appear on the pharmacy prescription label or on the package itself. Uh, these drugs, when they're no longer used or expired, they should be, you should get rid of them. Don't keep them in your house. Um, there is a lot of take back programs, um, otherwise you need to render them un unusable and disposable trash. So as far as take back programs, many pharmacies now have what's called a take back program where they'll have a, a bin or a container where you can just go in and dump all your uh, unneeded medication into that container. So a lot of these are being sponsored by the Department of Health. Um, I know that uh, right across the street, Dwayne Reed has a container. Uh, you can go online to look for take back programs in New York and you'll see many different uh, locations. Although I am told that a lot of the, even the smaller pharmacies, independent pharmacies are also having these particular containers. So one of the reasons why, you know, the preferred method of getting rid of this is to the take back home, take back program is we want to avoid unintentional drug overdoses. Again, you have, uh, uh, you know, some family and friends that have other intentions, they'll come in, they may, see your medications and they might think it's uh, a controlled substance. 
that they want to use for inappropriate uses, and they may take that and then um, use it incorrectly. Uh, there's still seven out of 10 people who have used prescription drugs, get them from friends and family. You also have to worry about uh, children getting a hold of these medications and getting themselves into trouble. So the, uh, it's definitely not recommended that you flush leftover medicine into our sinks. There's concern about these getting into our waterways and then eventually into our uh, drinking water. So the proper method, the ideal method is uh, you drop them off in these take back uh, programs. Some pharmacies may offer a mail back program. Maybe a mail order house might have that where you can mail back the unused medications to them and they'll dispose of them for you. Or as a last resort, you can dispose of them yourself. And this is what I mean by render them unusable. So the first thing is uh, leave them in the uh, original container. Mark out uh, any personal information, your name, the prescription number. Um, if it has your address, uh, mark that out as well. Uh, dilute pills with a small amount of water and that add something like coffee uh, grinds, cat litter, dirt into that container, close the container up. If it's a uh, liquid medication, then you can also add something undesirable like uh, coffee grinds, cat litter, or dirt into that, close it back up. And then you add this to an opaque container like a yogurt container or a snacks container. Uh, some people might use a soap container. And then dispose of this into a um, garbage uh, container. Hold on. Let's see here, this is hidden something. Okay, sorry. All right, so the last line just says hide the container in the trash and do not recycle. And the reason why I say that is. Uh, I mentioned some people will use a soap container. Those are recyclable containers, but in this case, it's not. By putting our unwanted medications, it's no longer recyclable. The um, one thing I just want to briefly touch on is uh, something called biosimilar. So we have a lot of medications. Most of these are injectable drugs, which go through a different pathway as far as competitors uh, um, getting in to be able to make uh, copies uh, of these particular products. So they're not generic equivalents and they go by different types of regulations. So because these are more complex agents manufactured through complex mechanisms, sometimes using uh, live cell cultures, uh, the FDA isn't granting those as generic interchanges. But they are starting to allow them to be marketed as biosimilars. So it's a similar pathway in that uh, when the company is making a biosimilar, they don't have to go through all of the uh, clinical testing that the innovator did, more on their process and the purity of their product. So as biosimilars, uh, it's not something that the pharmacist can change without the uh, 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 knowledge of the prescriber. So these will be prescribed by the doctors up front and then used appropriately. Um, the biosimilar companies are the same major manufacturers as our innovators. So companies like Merck and Pfizer and Amgen are going into the biosimilar market. So again, it's just another way of, um, and you may have heard something about this, as an effort to reduce um, medication costs. Uh, so these uh, will uh, come with a, uh, with a savings to the uh, healthcare system and eventually to the consumer.